Hello, friends and fiends. This is producer Derek popping in. Hope you enjoyed the Mothman episode last week. This is a special Halloween encore for bats. The current number of bat species as of March 2023 is 1,462. Hope you enjoy and learn a lot about bats. They need heroes. That's all. Enjoy the episode. Hello, friends and fiends. Welcome to Bugs Need Heroes, a podcast illustrating the inspiring abilities of insects. I'm Amanda. And I'm Kelly. Before we get started creating this bug-themed character, what's bugging you, Kelly? Ooh. Well, we got a lot of rain over here on the East Coast. It finally rained over here, too, which is unusual for Oregon for it to take so long. Well, we've got, I think we've got the winds, um, the very northern winds coming from that hurricane down in (laughs) Florida right now. So hopefully our our Florida listeners are safe and everyone's okay. But, um, and I have a sinus infection. So cool. You are the queen (laughs) of nasty face this this summer. I am. It is Now the fall. Well, you know, it got, we had that first day of it being really cold and um, we left the window open and I think it just dried out my sinuses. So, Uh, but I'm ready. I'm ready for fall. I know this, this podcast will air in October and we'll be way into the fall by then, but um, from, this is me reporting from the past and I'm excited. Past you. (laughs) Past me. Excited for fall. (laughs) Excited for fall. How about you, Amanda? What's in the Pacific here? Northwest, it kind of is a very much, it hits fall, fall time comes, and because we have so many gosh darn trees, it is fall instantly. It oh. goes from summer to, now it's fall, you guys. You guys, it's fall. <laughs> uh, we went from no leaves on the ground to all the leaves on the ground in the space of about 72 hours. <laughs> That's all it takes. Nothing that's podcast appropriate is bothering me lately. Like, so. <laughs> Too much interpersonal drama in my real life. Probably doesn't oh, even no. mention on the cast. Or is just uh, parasocial upsets. So, you know, what are you going to do? Oh, it happens. Well, speaking of um, interpersonal drama, we do we do have a guest today. A special guest. Our first special guest on the on the pod. I'm excited. Do you, do you uh, want to introduce him considering you're It is a voice and uh, <laughs> whose work you already know and love, listeners. It is... Derek, producer and editor Derek, is our special guest today uh, because we are going to have a special episode where we talk about not a bug, but the biggest bug of all, the bat. Welcome, welcome, producer Derek. Welcome, producer Derek, to your own podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I had a stress dream about this last night. I was giving a presentation and this guy kept interrupting me and I got docked (laughs) points for going over time. It was not a great dream. No. (laughs) But... But if I don't like anything in this, I can just I can just edit this afterwards too. So <laughs> yeah, there the is no going power. over time when you're the editor. Yeah, if I if I forget something, I'll just splice it in. Truly, you this should be the most perfect podcast of the all then because you have <laughs> oh, no. That's just gonna make it worse to think about. <laughs> <laughs> anything missing, you're just gonna slip it in because you have your own voice at your own disposal. Yeah. I can see you stress petting Rotunda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's here too. <laughs> oh, Rotunda. Does Rotunda like bats? <laughs> She's named after a bat. She's named after the vampire bat uh, because she was so fat when we got her. And Desmodus rotundus can drink over its own body weight. It'll like double in size almost when it feeds. Oof. And then they, uh, because that's mostly liquid, the blood they're drinking, they will then excrete it about 20 minutes after. And when she pees, you know, she wakes you up in the middle of the night with her. <laughs> it's just so loud. <laughs> This sounds like me at Thanksgiving. I get it. I get it, Rotunda. 20 minutes later, you're like, I gotta get rid of some of this. <laughs> I gotta get out of here. Yeah. Oh, that's so, so all cute. three of your cats previously mentioned on the cast, all three are named after bats. Yes, yes. Uh, by, by profession, I am a wildlife control operator. Uh, so I work with bats. We're in the midst of bat exclusion season right now. And by the time this airs, it'll be wrapped up. But... Yeah, so working with bats in that capacity now, but I also used to be a biological field tech, so I spent a couple seasons working with them in that capacity as well. And And you do a lot of citizen science work with bats too, right? Yeah, I do a lot of outreach. Um, So that's kind of what this podcast evolved out of. Are you going to 
tell your origin stories. How'd, how'd you get into bats? We talked episode one that Kelly started uh, as a bug kid and became a bug lady. How did you get into bats? <laughs> uh, I didn't really get into bats until college. They were living in one of the dorms that my friend was in. So they started showing up in hallways. And from there, I started doing a little bit more research and they don't have the best PR. So I thought that's something maybe I could I could have an effect on. They do have a pretty bad PR. They do. They get bad PR. I'm always surprised when I'm watching something and they're like, oh, no, I'm bad. It's tangled in my hair. I am going to have rabies now. And I'm like, is that a thing? I didn't think I never heard that as a kid. The rabies thing gets overblown a bit because sick bats are so much more likely to come into contact with people than healthy bats. So there's a sampling bias there, but less than 1% of the wild population has rabies at any given time. Now, does rabies, uh, is rabies species or group uh, taxon specific for bats or can they all get it? All mammals can get it. You don't find it as much in rodents because things that would bite them to transmit rabies tend to bite them lethally. Like a squirrel, if it gets bit by a rabid, you know, raccoon is not going to survive that bite. So Mm. But are there more, are there specific species of bat that are more likely? um... It seems like the silver haired bat, for whatever reason, is more likely or is found more often with rabies than uh, you'd expect. But the big one is actually vampire bats because they feed on blood. They're specifically biting other animals all the time. And there was a really interesting talk at uh, NASBUR Mm -hmm. about giving them a herpes virus that was spliced to produce some rabies virus proteins so that the bats would then generate an immune response and become immune to rabies. Is that oh, Darcy cool. to want an inside? No, that is, that is that's, Desi. That's I'm going to go deal with it. <laughs> okay, yeah, was, who was yowling at the door? Yeah, so, so we'll Mother, Father, we'll let, me, let me in, Father. <laughs> father, you're cruel. Cruel, Father. You, father. <laughs> you're a cruel master, Father. I love Victorian cats. <laughs> <laughs> Every cat is just a reincarnated Victorian. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Every single one. <laughs> Father, I Mother, can't believe you've done this. Mother, where She's... are my kisses? <laughs> but I need my kisses. <laughs> oh, that's going to show up at the end of a show somewhere. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I'm going to that and be like, ah, oh, yes, cat content. My favorite content. <laughs> so we should say that there is... Of uh, uh, an obscure character based on the bat already. <laughs> you may know him as <laughs> Batman. <laughs> is he the Batman? This is the question that comes up every oh. single time you mention a hero. Is it the character or is it a just the character? He's Superman. He's not the Superman, but he might be the Batman. Hmm. Well, one thing I liked about the Robert Pattinson Batman movie is that he was very much telling people that his name was vengeance the whole time i I thought that was the funniest thing on the planet the whole time he was like it's vengeance and everyone's like no man you're the batman and he's like no i'm vengeance it was such a subtle joke so good i no, he says it a lot in both the comics and the animated series he would say i am vengeance i am the knight i am batman and so i think it's just kind of a play on that but I think it's very apt to assume that Bruce Wayne did not name himself Batman mm. because it's kind of a stupid name. Yeah. If you take all the context away from it that we know it and, and love it and it's such an icon now. But if someone came up to you and said, I'm Raccoon Man, you'd be like, that's a ridiculous yeah, Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Name yourself better. So he wanted to, in, at least in the Robert Pattinson uh, version, he wanted to be called Vengeance. I like but that. That's kind of fun. Him. It was so subtle. It was such a great like. He's bad at this, you guys. Like secretly, he, <laughs> he's actually not good at this. He's also. I he's... still have not seen this movie. I need to. Oh, I need I think to you'd like watch it. it. I like Robert it, it, Pattinson, and I thought watching the trailer said he looked. You like do a love a pick. dirty, dirty man, and he is love a dirty, <laughs> dirty, <laughs> dirty man, <laughs> dirty little hobo man in in this version. Yeah. I, I liked parts of it. I, I had some issues with some parts of it. I The things I had issue with were more the um, the movie making aspects than like any of the story or anything. Like they spend a long time just like with lingering shots of explosions. And you're like, we get oh. it. <laughs> we get it. It's on fire. We get it. Well, how um if we're, ta- if we're talking Batman, Derek, how yeah. does Batman match up to real bats? How many, how many has, legs do you give the Batman? No, no power. How many wings oh. does the Batman how many, get? How many wing segments? How many knuckle bones? So, yeah, he doesn't match up in, in 
many ways. I mean, he can't fly for one. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing that bats have <laughs> going for them. The group of bats is called, the order of bats, I should say, is Chiroptera, which means hand wing. So they have all the same dexterity in those wings that we have in our hands. They have a slightly reduced index finger, but otherwise all of those joints are there. So they're actually able to generate more lift per wing beat than a bird does or an insect. And that allows them to generate a lot of really unique acrobatic features, which, you know, Batman being an acrobat, that kind of checks out. But they're up there doing flips, spinning around. Their wings are proportionally much heavier compared to the, their body, compared to a bird, because they have, you know, their bones aren't hollow. Yeah. So they're able to throw an arm out and then use that to flip like a gymnast. Really impressive little guys. They will flip around. I mean, every time they land, they have to do a full flip. And let's see, I got to find my notes here. I got too many tabs open. <laughs> so I would I would argue that so far Nightwing sounds more like a bat than Batman does. <laughs> yeah, and actually Nightwing, if you're going to map him onto a nocturnal bird, it would be a nightjar, which yeah. is a a small, very camouflaged bird that hunts at dawn and dusk, just like a bat does. When I worked for my state's uh, division of fish and wildlife, I was uh, doing some research on uh, endangered bird species. And uh, when I was doing grassland birds, because I've also worked with shorebirds, I found uh, several common nightjar nests, and they nest on the ground in little divots. And who did she not like me being near her baby? <laughs> <laughs> she swooped you. She would get up and she'd dive bomb, and she also made this crazy noise. Um, and everyone should Google what a nightjar looks like with its mouth open. It is oh. a lot. Uh, but beautiful. I think really cool looking. Very camouflage bird. Really neat. Amanda, you've probably seen the Putu. That is a yes, I've seen the Putu. Oh, okay. Yes, I have seen the Putu. Mm. In particular, as related to the Witcher memes, because the uh, contacts on the Witcher are not quite right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have a hard time looking at his Ooh. eyes. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. They should have just CGI'd it in later, but that's fine. So Batman does have a cape, and in, I think it's the Nolan movies, there's some fancy tech gadget that uh, Mr. Fox gives him to let him make those that cape go rigid. And in yeah. that way, it does kind of resemble a wing uh, with the patagium, which is that skin going between the fingers. Mm -hmm. And in that patagium, there are actually tiny muscles that they can flex at different times to change the air resistance of the wing mid-flight. And there's tiny hairs that give them very acute uh, sensitivity to the wind currents as they're flying. So that that is a pretty, pretty special structure that they have in their wings. And they can use that to grab prey in the air and then deliver it to their mouth. And they also, many bats have a, another kind of a third wing going between their feet that they can use to scoop things up. They, they scoop with it? They can scoop, yes. So can a, I've heard that a bat can't glide. Is that true? No, they can glide. Uh, okay. It very much depends on the size of the bat. Okay. okay. Uh, bats are heavy compared to birds because they, they're not full of air sacs. Their bones are solid. So by comparison, a bat the size of a robin needs a wingspan similar to the, that of a crow. So they have much larger wings proportionally. And that's just because they're having to scoop so much air out of the way to keep themselves aloft. Yeah, they don't have like an airfoil the same way that a bird does with the feathers. So it's gliding more like a flying squirrel than gliding mm. like a red-tailed hawk oh okay. so it's, oh, okay, it's, it's okay. like a controlled fall <laughs> they're fallen with style these bats <laughs> <laughs> okay so i've uploaded a couple of videos into the live chat it seems like they're really working hard to launch from the ground yeah most bats are not very skilled at taking off from the ground so it's usually recommended if you find a bat first of all don't touch it with your bare hands mm -hmm. uh, use a stick to lift it up and put it in a tree their back feet are adapted for hanging. So if you can get those, the stick underneath those back feet, they'll kind of latch on automatically. And then you can just kind of droop him into a tree and then come nightfall, he'll probably take off on his own. And if, if they don't leave, then it's recommended contacting a wildlife rehabilitator. Oh man. Okay. So I'm watching these videos and the, it's the, the bat approaching whatever he wants to land on and then just kicking them feet up so he can land on it which of course makes sense because the stereotype is that they're upside down because that's how they hang out literally hang about but i i just i haven't thought about like i'm gonna come in for a landing upside down it's quite the 
the scooping motion up into the the ceiling here. So what watching the the bats, you know, go upside down, have to be upside down for for me, that would be very uncomfortable on my face because all the blood will rush to my head. Do bats have a, a sort of adapted circulatory system for being upside down for so long? Bats have a lot of really cool adaptations for their extreme lifestyle of hanging upside down and flight and and echolocating and all of these. And a lot of them have feedback loops into each other. Like their lung capacity is about 72% larger than it would be for an equivalently sized mammal. And their hearts are somewhere between one and 2% of their body mass. So that is a huge heart for such a small little guy. And those hearts can beat up to a thousand times per minute when they get going. One of the things about flying is that you're shoving all that blood to the ends of your wings. So they they have those muscles in their wings to contract the stiffness of the patagium, but they also have little muscles that kind of act as secondary hearts to pump that blood back to the body. So having a larger heart, having adaptations to keep that blood flowing around all kind of contribute to keeping that blood flowing. And their blood cells are actually smaller than in other mammals. So they have a higher surface area to deliver more oxygen per red blood cell as they go through their bodies. Does that Yeah, alleviate? that's I I I'm just thinking about the implications of like little not quite pumps throughout their body. I am more familiar with behavioral and ecology aspects of bats mm-hmm. versus uh physiological ones. So a lot of my if you ask me specific questions about their ph- physiology, I may not know the answer and I'll have to look that up and then edit it in later. Yeah. That's fine. Um, I don't know everything about every bug, so you're not, you can't know every every specific part of you know of an animal. And we should say that there are fourteen thousand species of bats, over wow. fourteen thousand species of bats that have been discovered so far, and so only a few of those have really been studied in depth. And there's so much mm-hmm. that we don't know. Echolocation was only discovered in the 1950s. That's crazy. Oh, really? It's that recent? It's like plate tectonics, which was only really considered a theory in the 60s. Isn't that insane? (laughs) (laughs) The modern era is so much shorter than I think it is. (laughs) Well, do you have a favorite uh, favorite bat, Derek? It varies uh, back and forth. Uh, The one I probably see the most often, and so I'm always excited to see, is probably the big brown bat. They have a lot of really cool adaptations. They're probably the most urban bat at this point, at least Mm. in North America because they'll regularly use houses and things. They don't exhibit the same amount of lunar phobia. So bats are afraid of the moon. They Aww. don't like bright lights. So light pollution affects bats quite a lot. Uh, sound pollution does as well, but big brown bats seem to exhibit less of a negative effect from light pollution compared to some other species. So they do better in urban areas. They're called the big brown bat, but they're still pretty small, uh, only a little bit larger than a mouse. Hmm. What's the distribution of the big brown bat? They go up into Canada, down uh, to Central America, I believe. It's a pretty big range. Most of the United and States has them. East, east to west, too. Yes. Yeah. Full range. Wow. It's it's really unusual for a, a mammal like that to have, I think, full east west. Uh, it's possible. Right? It's cryptic, like that. There could be multiple species. That's always a possibility mm-hmm. with bats. Uh, They can hybridize to some extent within their genus, and a lot of the species can only really be distinguished by their echolocation calls or if you do genetic testing. Oh, interesting. Wow. Yeah, so each bat species sings a very specific echolocation song, and they'll sing songs to attract mates and things, but that's something that we've only really found out about since we discovered echolocation 50 years ago, and there's a lot of research that goes into that and trying to establish call libraries of different bat species. So there's tons of bats that we're probably missing because we don't have a full echolocation repertoire for different parts of the world. Is that how the different species distinguish each other as well through their calls? That's definitely part of it. Uh, We know that they do a lot of different behaviors with echolocation, such as eavesdropping. So they will listen for where other bats are foraging to find the best places to hunt insects. And they will... (laughs) Smart. uh, They'll actually some species will jam each other. So they'll yell, hey, 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 or whatever to get another bat to miss an insect during its approach. <laughs> so they're jerks. They can be. They Some of them are territorial to some extent. So 
the hoary bat, which is one of the larger species in the United States. They're beautiful creatures. H O A R Y, hoary. Uh, like they're covered in frost because they, they kind of have a silvery color to them. And they patrol edge habitats, particularly. It's one of their favorite spots. So uh, where a meadow meets a line of trees. And they will kind of defend that area from other bats and chase them off. Oh, they're very cute. I just looked up the photo. I meant so to much check information. out this bat. It's adorable. Oh, oh, I'll, I'll slide over. Uh, so much information just got dropped into my brain hole just now it's like in a very short amount of time but the one that's sending me the most is that bats are afraid of the moon <laughs> like that makes no sense at all <laughs> it was like fly to the air like ah, ah, there it is ah, ah, ah. oh look at that little guy look at that hoary bat oh, oh so he looks... cute. and i've heard that i i know that this term sometimes gets thrown around and people don't like it but sky puppy is a very apt description <laughs> of this bat he looks oh, soft they look so like their soft. fur is soft i think it's uh the krogan and mass effect are actually modeled after some bats like this oh my gosh i just can't stop looking into his soulful eyes <laughs> <laughs> So being afraid of the moon is actually uh, being afraid of owls and predators like that. Oh, because having more moonlight uh, lets those predators which hunt by vision catch the bats more easily. I see. To total I see. It's, it's much funnier if they're like were bats and they're yeah, yeah, afraid of the moon. Of so, the moon. <laughs> yeah, there's some some difference in the amount of bat uh, activity you'll find on full moon or brightly lit nights than you will on new moons. So they're not like, I don't even want to say moths because moths will often gather around like lamps and stuff. So is it unlikely that even though there's a ton of moths around the lamp that a bat will come by and scoop those little mothy guys up? So that's one of the things that we've seen in the past decade or so as cities have switched out their lights. So different lights attract insects at different rates, different types of lights. Ah. So the mm -hmm. old mercury vapor bulbs attract insects like crazy. The newer LED ones do not seem to have that same impact. So as places have changed their lighting in urban areas, they've also affected the insect and thus the bat population dynamics in those areas. And I've seen that there are some cities which have switched out their lights for red lamps, which may have less of an impact on the insects and the bats. But there's still a lot that we don't know about how light pollution plays a role in urban environments. The thing with the lights is um, uh, the lights that we used to use before Dow used to were switching to LEDs. Uh, those li former lights would put heat off and insects are attracted to heat. Oh, so it's um, light and heat that the, the yeah. bugs are at. And, and the LEDs are the wrong, um, they're the wrong wavelength, the wrong light wavelength. So the insects are less attracted to those as well. So that that, that's helpful. Man, that's helpful at all. Thinking about like we've got the bugs. intersection now between the bats and the bugs. <laughs> bugs Need Heroes podcast. Yeah, moths in particular have a lot of really unique adaptations for avoiding bats. Mm -hmm. There's even some moth species that have switched to becoming diurnal to avoid the bats. And I'm going to drop a picture in the chat of one of my favorite bats that has some pretty unique adaptations for catching moths. Well, we've mentioned, I think, in episode two with Isabella that some moths will radiate a different sound to like try and block out the more sophisticated than just going hey 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 this is my tree hey <laughs> hey 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 these are my bugs is that they've they've created some sort of jamming effect with their frequencies some of them can do that um, others have long uh sort of long tails on the end of their wings and while they fly these tails create um confusing motion which messes up bat echolocation too oh so like a is that i guess swallowtail's a butterfly so that's maybe yeah. not uh, quite the same thing picture like a luna moth have you ever seen a luna yeah moth? yeah like, like the that, long the long tail tight yeah. tails yeah interesting i never knew what those were for i just assumed they were aesthetic in some way but <laughs> the ladies love them the ladies are just like oh, look at his long tails oh my goodness so i've dropped oh, in the discord a picture ears. a picture of the spotted bat which is a species that we do have in Oregon. It's found in the Western United States in arid regions. It is a moth specialist. So it particularly hunts those moths that have ears by echolocating at a lower frequency. So most bats we can't hear because they're, you know, using ultrasound. But 
spotted bats have a pitch that is lower than ultrasound so the moths can't hear them because the moths are adapted to hearing the bat ultrasound so it's kind of like a stealth fighter version of a bat appropriate that it hunts moths given that its ears are so large that it reminds me of like the really furry antenna that we've been seeing on on our moth species on the podcast that he his ears even kind of resemble the moth antenna (laughs) just so huge so derek why thinking about that um why do some bats have these very large ears and others have little tiny ears yeah if they're all using echolocation wouldn't they all need big ears they aren't they aren't all using echolocation that's what it comes down to so these huge ears um for the spotted bat they're actually like a third of its body length and there's some evidence if you put a little bat in the wind tunnel that those ears actually will generate some lift and that's important because (laughs) oh that's so cute It's like a bunny. Like, that's how big the ears are. It's like a a bunny trying to fly through the sky. These bats are sometimes called whisper bats with these huge ears. They're not echolocating actively to find insects. They're listening for the sounds the insects generate themselves. This Mm. hunting strategy is called gleaning, and in contrast to hawking, which is where you catch them out of the air. Mm -hmm. So there's, in one of the BBC Attenborough specials, there's a fantastic clip. I think it's Life of Mammals, where... uh, I think it is a brown big-eared bat is hunting a moth or a katydid or something on a on a leaf, and the moth is being so still because it knows if it moves, the bat will detect it. I I do have to say, you said there's fourteen thousand bat variations. Fourteen hundred. Okay, sorry, that was a way bigger number. (laughs) That's a big difference. Uh, Wow. (laughs) Well, I mean, fourteen hundred is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, Uh. that's a lot of variations of what is essentially the same shape of little guy, big wings. And uh, so far we've had names like spotted bat, big brown bat, little bat, bat that's in my house. Like they all just seem to have like the most banal names. Just like, uh, look at that bat. What color is it? Uh, it's brown. Is it big or is it small? It's big. <laughs> yeah. The common the names bat. match much more closely than you get with birds sometimes. <laughs> Are there any particularly funny common names for bats that aren't just... There is a spectacled bat, um, which looks like it has glasses. It's no blue-footed booby, but I'll allow it. Mm, Yeah, I'll take it. (laughs) The bat beep. Speaking of spectacles, Derek, uh, the whole blind as a bat trope, what can you tell us about their eyesight? Yeah, if they're not all using echolocation, are there there any of them that are using sight-specific? So all of the big fruit bats, the flying foxes, all rely on sight. They cannot echolocate. And there's a big debate over whether bats developed echolocation first or flight first. Mm. Uh, If they developed echolocation first, then that means that bats lost the ability to echolocate. The flying foxes and stuff. Yeah, and there may be a, there's a good physiological reason for that. I mean, essentially, echolocating is a free action when you're flapping Mm -hmm. your wings because you're already breathing out with each wing beat kind of but when you're larger you're making fewer wing beats so that then becomes less easy well wait Derek, can can you explain for the listeners how how a bat creates echolocation yeah for most of them it's basically screaming so (laughs) (laughs) yeah because they're they're using their their larynx to generate sounds there's a, a sm- one genus of fruit-eating bats that does it by clicking their tongue, but generally it's it's tied to their lungs, just like our speech is. Okay. And there's there's some that do echolocate through their nose, which is kind of like humming, but for other ones, it is basically screaming. And so that's why you see a lot of pictures <laughs> of bats with their mouths open when they're flying. It's They're echolocating in flight. Very cool. Very, very cool. And that's different from, from like whales who echolocate. In what way? Whales would be similar to uh, humming in that same way. Mm. They have a a melon organ in their head that essentially reverberates and focuses the sound that they make by sort of like humming, but they're not breathing out at the same time. They're forcing air through their their body. Yeah, they force it up through that top part of their head to create the vibration. Right, right, right. The, the, The big old forehead that we see on so many of them that five head yeah (laughs) if you've seen a what is it finding dory they uh they have an interesting character who (laughs) needs to echo locate and can't i i need to use the bathroom sorry hold on all right be free
Okay, so I uploaded a picture of that spectacled bat into the chat so you can see him. Let's see. Oh, he's cute. He does look like he's wearing little glasses. Oh, yeah. that's a, that's. He's a teddy bear of a bat. Mm-hmm. Their vision is probably comparable to that of a cat, whereas most bats would probably be more comparable to a dog or a uh, a rat. So they don't have great color vision because they're adapted to seeing at night. But over long distances, that's kind of what they would use to navigate. Because you can see the horizon. Some bats can even see into the UV uh, to go to flowers or polarized light mm. to navigate. Yeah, can you talk about one of one of my favorite topics is um, bats as pollinators? Yeah, so there bats All have been secret pollinators. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love a me. secret pollinator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so bats have been observed to be. Sorry, I just clicked something, so that's something I'm going to have to edit out. So hold on, let me go back. (laughs) That's okay. Reset. So bats have been documented visiting over 500 different flower species, and that represents about 70 different plant families. And they'll spread seeds of even more than that. I mean, well, maybe not more than that. A lot of seeds. Because (laughs) bats aren't afraid to fly over open spaces the way that birds are, so they represent one of the primary seed dispersals for disturbed forests, particularly rainforests, because they'll eat those plants, fly over some open area, poop in the whole way, because bats have a high volume, low processing gut strategy. They don't have an appendix either, but so they're eating as much as they can, getting as nutrients as fast as they can, and then getting the rest out, similar to like an elephant. So they're not like laying oh, that say. ferment or whatever inside their guts to get more digestion because the more weight you have the harder it is to fly right so that's why bats eat so many insects with with birds it's usually um a bird will defecate before takeoff and it's to kind of lighten their body load Uh because weight is really important for birds it's why their bones are hollow do bats are just pooping all the time it's not a pre-flight and in the breeze (laughs) yeah it's a lot of poop and for for insect eating bats you can distinguish their poop from mouse poop because although they're the same size bat poop is mostly insect exoskeletons so it crumbles Mm. if you touch it and it is has some shininess to it slow almost sparkly but yeah bats are pooping a lot that's is insectivore poop also what's the word guano is and is there a distinction between guano and just other kinds? Because so far we've talked about bats that eat fruit, bats that eat bugs, bats that drink blood. And then it sounds like pollinators. I When I hear pollinator, I, I hear drinks nectar. I don't know if that's technically true. Uh, but that's what my brain associates with. Is there, because are they? it's all just guano or is guano like specifically those cave bats where it's filled up the floor? I think if you look at like the word use historically, it was meant to connote highly valuable fertilizer. So like a cave where you could mine the guano to use it for saltpeter, you know, explosives um, or fertilizer. So in that sense, it was also used to denote uh, seabird poop because yeah, you get marine islands where you have all of the like terns or puffins or whatever coming and they poop a whole lot there and you can go mine it and then use that for different industrial uses because that was Mm. one of the historic ways to get a lot of nitrogen so in caves bats are still extremely important because they're the link between the sun and the cave system so all of these little bugs that live only in these caves are dependent on bat poop because that's the way that they get energy from the sun they're okay i see so they're bringing foreign things into the cave that the other bugs rely on yeah, and they can actually alter the cave ecosystem quite a lot. Like there's some evidence that having bats in a mine will change the deposition of stalactites and stalagmites. By, Is that by because changing. of like heat or it's more or... the chemicals. Oh, okay. So they'll change the acidity of the environment. And there's some bats which are technically classified as extremophiles because the caves they live in have such extreme ammonia that mm, other right. animals cannot survive famously stinky these bat caves <laughs> yeah and i've heard actually that the uh the flying foxes are stinkier than these caves i think anything that eats fruit is gonna cause a, a stinky sensation <laughs> yeah there's a lot of conflict in australia uh, around these flying fox camps where they will move into a park because all of the natural areas have been deforested so 
these parks are some of the last roosts available and they oh, will so, so there's a big a tree at fourth and mill plane <laughs> and then, oh no the, the flying foxes have moved into mill plane park and now it stinks Yes, that, that can be part oh. of the conflict. Also, that aside from the smell, uh, they can be quite noisy. Bats are very chatty creatures. They're very social. So they spend a lot of time talking to each other and at each other. Interesting. Uh, speaking of social, we did have a, a listener question from uh, Marcus in New York City. Do social bats have like a hierarchical structure? That's hard to say because a lot of bats have not been studied in depth for their social systems because it's hard to study bats in the wild in a lot of cases like uh this is kind of a newer issue but the glue that was being used to affix radio tags has been discontinued so there is a big oh yeah there's a, there a big oh, no. uh, subject of debate <laughs> and discussion at what the... a niche problem uh, guys we're out of the body glue <laughs> it's gone <laughs> there's no more body glue yeah, so studying bats can be fairly fraught in that way. But one of the best studied bats with regards to social systems is the vampire bat. And there is a professor at, I think he's at the Ohio State University, uh, Dr. Jerry Carter, who has a website, socialbat.org, and he studies the social systems of vampire bats. And they have a matriarchal structure. So it's popular mm-hmm. females kind of rule the roost. And that comes down to who shares with whom vampire bats have to eat regularly or they will starve to death blood isn't very nutritious so they have to eat about every 72 hours or so so to get around this they will actually regurgitate some of their blood to another bat that is starving and missed a meal oh wow it's a really intense relationship that they have it starts out with like grooming it's a lot of trust yes Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah. there's a whole system of who shares with whom which order you go to ask for food it's a lot, a lot of really complex stuff. And check out socialbat.org. He's got tons of pictures and videos of the little bats doing what looks like French kissing each other to share the blood back and forth. <laughs> well, vampires, famously sexy. So, yeah. <laughs> Anne Rice, look out. These vampires. But generally, bats. live in matriarchal structures. So it'll be the bats coming together during the summer or their breeding season, all the females together, and the males will roost separately perhaps individually or in small groups. But the big colonies that we think of as, you know, a bat colony is generally females. And during the mating season, though, different bats have different strategies. Some of them do lecking, which is where one bat will display and attract females to his spot. And hey, check out a, my pad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like a little convention where all the bats, you know, this is what I'm selling. Come check me out. And they're, you know, honking with their various perfumes that they produce th- themselves singing songs with the little honking noises uh the the hammer-headed bat is probably one of the best examples of this as they are so extremely sexually dimorphic they're actually my least favorite bat because they're they're kind of hideous and people are sure this. <laughs> they're the, the howler monkeys of bats <laughs> they look like the jersey devil is the best way oh, to describe them oh, oh. oh i've seen those before yeah mm-hmm. what um so this i guess this was also i think a listener question from uh i think it was clarice and how how do they choose their mates then? What are some of the more I guess interesting mate finding or uh, other mate, than speed mate dating decision. conventions? <laughs> yeah, we see with birds, males have to be very colorful and vibrant. Mm-hmm. Um, what what's going on with bats? Uh, there is a uh, I believe it's the Chapin's free tailed bat is probably the best showiest of the male bats, where it has a full mohawk that it can extend. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> and there are others that have shoulder Pop plumes rock. that come out as little epaulets, and they do a little dances when they have these these long hairs to spread their fragrance. And then there's a few others that will have little sacks in their wings, and they use those to store their scent. And then they kind of waft the perfume by hovering in front of a female. I didn't realize bats were so scent heavy. Yeah, you don't think about it as much, but for a lot of mammals, there is. I mean, mammals evolved from small nocturnal animals that would rely on scent quite a lot. So it makes sense that some of that is held over. So we talked briefly about the the sharing of, of blood via regurgitation. I've also heard a rumor that that some kinds of bats will adopt babies that have been left behind. We know that's true in vampire bats, at least in captive vampire bats. Uh, how much it's happening in the wild may come from a a fundamental misunderstanding of bats. Mm. So there is a bat species in 
the southwest United States going down into South America called the Mexican fruit-tailed bat. And they form huge maternity colonies in caves. There's 20 million or so in one cave in Texas, Bracken Cave. They're the ones that live in the bridge in Austin. And researchers went into these caves and they found all of these little baby bats together in a creche, up to 500 little bats in one square foot. So huge numbers of bats. And they just kind of assumed that the mother bats were just flying in here and nursing whichever bat they came upon first. Oh, okay, first. okay. The duck but, strategy. <laughs> yeah, it eventually <laughs> was revealed that, no, they're finding their specific pup. They're remembering the sound their baby makes and the oh, smell wow. it has and where they left it. So less so, duck, more penguin. Yes, yeah, that'd be a good way to compare. <laughs> so in that regard, the adoption may be a little bit of a misconception mm-hmm. from that mm-hmm. early assumption. But we know that for vampire bats, they have an extended adolescence because they have to learn how to feed from arguably the most challenging thing they can do. I mean, a cow, which is their primary food source, usually weighs, you know, a thousand times what they do and could easily crush them with a step. So they have a protracted adolescence and are extremely social because they're living with their mother, their aunts, their sisters in Mm. a group. That's interesting. So... We've talked about rabies and the the cliche of like, it's in my hair. Uh, If I'm worried about being bit by a bat, specifically the vampire bat, where are the vampire bats? So I can not go there. (laughs) Vampire bats live in uh, Central and South America. So there there's been like one sighting of a different bat. So there's three different vampire bat species. Only one of them feeds from mammals regularly. Oh, okay. There's been one of the other species that was found in Texas one time 50 plus years ago. So it's not a really going concern for the United States currently. And I know that there is periodic monitoring by the U.S. Department of Agriculture for those bats, as that would cause some alarm among cattle ranchers, to be sure. Mm -hmm. The amount of blood they take is like two tablespoons or less than that. So it's not very much blood, but the concern is that they could spread disease. And the other thing they do is because they're biting these cows... They cause the leather to be lower quality. (laughs) Because it got little scar marks in the leather? Yes. Oh. What uh, what other mammals do they feed off of? It's mostly livestock at this point. So Yeah. uh, Just because of the livestock's around. Availability. Yeah, yeah. But they've been documented feeding from cougars, uh, tapirs, (laughs) sea lions. So they're pretty pretty varied in that way. Oh, okay. They're generalists. Then. Yeah, and they will remember the name of a, or not the name, but the sound <laughs> of the breath of an animal making. So they will return to that visit that same animal once once they find it night after night if they know where it's at. I remember the sound of your breath. <laughs> what like more sexy intense. sexy vampires? <laughs> sexy vampires. I'm here for your breath. <laughs> yeah, they're they're probably the, one of the most unique mammals of all because they have such a unique niche that they fill. Mm-hmm. Nothing else quite does that. The other vampire bats feed from birds primarily. Oh, okay. Mm. Uh, that would be difficult. Aren't they roughly the same size? Uh, larger birds like chickens would be a, a common one. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. But the, what they do is they sneak up on a bird that's sleeping while it's in a perch and they crawl on the underside of the branch to bite its little toesies. Oh. And vampires bats actually produce what could be called venom so for those ones that feed on birds their saliva uh softens the keratin a little bit on the bird's feet so they can bite mm. it more easily whereas for the other vampires or i guess them as well their saliva contains an anticoagulant to make the blood flow for longer and this was being investigated for a potential medi- medical use in humans but like I think mosquitoes the for that have stopped yeah yeah and just like mosquitoes in that way interesting amanda's face is is a lot right now <laughs> i'm just thinking about i sorry i was thinking about vampire bats as like it just doesn't seem like a winning strategy to me to be like oh i'm gonna come steal your blood it just doesn't it just seems like it's a really difficult thing to do um for, I, for... I, I, if i had to get blood from someone else that would be really difficult for me to do without like literally fighting them and so they've really developed this sneaky way of just <laughs> sneaking up on you and taking just a little bit of your blood and then littering away to go french kiss it into their friends mouths <laughs> it's just i can see the appeal of being a vampire <laughs> for ev- evolution it just has to work it, it, it doesn't have to exactly. work amazing. it doesn't have to be it easy to it just has to work 
And the crazy part is their closest relatives are probably nectar feeding bats. So, so what you're telling me is the cow is the flower. <laughs> and, <laughs> and his nectar is the blood. <laughs> yeah, they, they have a lot of really cool adaptations for this lifestyle, including that they have heat sensors in their nose to mm. detect where the blood is closest to the surface. Because mm-hmm. that's where it's going to be warmest on the cow or, or the pig or, or whoever. They're technically a leaf nose bat, although they have such a short little face. Leaf noses have evolved in bats to direct those echolocation calls through their nose. So they can essentially aim those by focusing their nose, they, by how they, they gotta, scrunch, scrunch it up. Uh, it looks a, like a little a, leaf a dish. They're very cute. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's like a radar point. dish on their face. A radar dish right on the face, which you don't see as much anymore, the radar dish. So, uh, Derek, I'd like to ask a question that I'm assuming a lot of people will be thinking about this. Uh, what's going on with white nose syndrome? Mm. Can you talk to us about that? So I just got back from the North American Symposium on Bat Research, and I skipped every single white nose session because <laughs> they kind of bummed me out. Yeah, fair Aww. enough. <laughs> so white nose syndrome is a fungus that came over from Europe, and it grows on hibernating bats' bodies and irritates them and essentially wakes them up from hibernation. Each time a bat wakes up from hibernation, it loses several weeks of stored energy that it could be using for hibernation because they raise their body temperature up. Bats can essentially become, or some bats can essentially become cold-blooded during parts of the year. So they lower their body temperature down to ambient. So each time they get woken up by this fungus growing on them, they lose some of their savings and they eventually starve. Since it was found in 2006, it has spread to the majority of states and has caused millions and millions of bats to die prematurely. There is some good news in that some of those caves that were affected early on have seen their numbers increase since then. So some bats have survived and are recovering, but it'll still be quite a long time as bats generally only have one baby per year. Hmm. Um, is, uh, is white nose only in North America? North the and fungus South has been found in Europe and Asia. So it's it thought that those bats happened. survived it at some point or co-evolved with it, so they don't see the same mortalities. And it doesn't affect all hibernating bat species. It seems to affect some more than others. Like the Townsend big-eared bat does not seem to be affected. Okay. Oh, those poor bats. Yeah, just, that what a horrible way to go, that you're just like, wake up and you're like, oh no, fungus! Yeah, it wakes <laughs> them up, and then they, they'll sometimes leave the cave and go out searching for like water or insects, and because it's wintertime, those aren't available. So they're mm. burning even more energy than just waking up. So you said they only have one pup a year. Is that because they're oh, the vampire bat? You said they had a extended. They have kind of a teenage dumb where they're learning how to be good little ninjas. But uh, are they good moms? The way that we talked briefly on this podcast that like insects aren't good moms. They kind of don't <laughs> care much. D- but, depends uh, on the species, but yeah, depends on the species. Are not we, haven't, we haven't talked about, uh, about a mothering bug yet, but we will. Our, we, will. <laughs> we will. I'm sure we will get there. But bats are good moms. Yeah, w- bats have extremely large babies. So when a oh. bat pup is born, it's somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of its mother's body weight. Oh, that poor mama. Oh, no. I mean, and as she- someone who gave birth to a nine pound baby, let me tell you. <laughs> they get you. Yeah, and then they uh, they got to produce milk for that baby. So pregnant and lactating bats will consume huge amounts of food during that time. Mm. Uh, do they have twins sometimes? There are a few species which have twins, uh, but generally bats are, are having one pup per year. Oh, I think the one little puppy <laughs> under each wing. That's so cute. <laughs> the hoary bat can have up to four at a time. Oh my gosh! Um, oh, and wow. bats in that genus can can have multiples. Twinning is is the common strategy for them, but most bats it's just one. One very large baby that takes a lot of resources, <laughs> but then will be independent by the end of the summer. And the bat baby just clings on, just <sighs> for for a time. Okay, but then she'll leave it behind once it gets too big at a crash mm. site or in a tree or, or you know wherever the roost is. So if a bat was flying and the baby was attached to it, and then that baby fell off, but then landed in a bird's nest. With those birds. <laughs> this is a Disney movie? Are you quoting it's a Disney a, movie right now? It's a book called Stella Luna, and it is the best book of all time. Uh, it's a story of a, a, I think it's a fruit bat that falls and lands in a bird's nest. 
and so the birds raised it as a bird and so it like has all this identity confusion about like what's a bat what's a bird uh, happy i, I told you i met the bat. author right yeah yeah the, yeah yeah janelle cannon she's she's wonderful yeah that bat is actually uh she was inspired by a photo gallery in uh national geographic about the one of the epauletted fruit bats from africa that merlin tuttle took pictures of they are extremely cute little bats so highly recommend looking up pictures of epauletted fruit bats and if you haven't read the book stella luna it's extremely cute the illustrations in it are breathtaking so you've met merlin tuttle right yes yeah i've met him a couple What's times he, like? he he is uh, a luminary figure in bat conservation He's been not too luminary this. though, because then the bats will be scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his his uh, photography of bats has really changed the way we view bats. He's the founder of Bat Conservation International. Mm-hmm. There's a great episode of 99 PI about his work with the bridge in Austin. So I c- I can't say enough good things about about the work that he's done. Oh, so sometimes you can meet your heroes. Yeah, he was nice. he was one I was nervous about, but he's been great. That's always good to hear. He's just a dude who loves bats and wants the bats to be good. <laughs> I Plus if- Merlin Tuttle, what a name. What I'll a probably name. cut this from the podcast, but at Nasber, <laughs> we wa- I happened to be walking past, um, they had prints of his work for like yeah. auction. And I walked past it as I was talking to him and Teresa, his social media person. And he like stopped to criticize everything about this amazing <laughs> picture he'd taken. <laughs> It's like the composition is off. It's bad. The lighting is wrong. All Classic these artist. Like, yeah, just yeah. All he sees is how it's not good. Oh. Yeah. 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 We've all been there. <laughs> the thing I had in my head was so much better than what came out, but all anyone else sees is the thing. So, but yeah, we should direct people to Merlin Tuttle's website, MerlinTuttle.org and look at his photo galleries. Cause he has, yeah, his, his photos are gorgeous. Absolutely yeah. It's just beautiful. thousands of pictures of like the coolest pictures I've ever seen of bats. They're so neat. Like if you've seen a poster of a bat, it was probably taken by Merlin Tuttle. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I can't really do much for bats living in my apartment in a city, but for listeners who are in a more um, suburban or rural setting is what about bat houses? Can, how do you attract bats to your home? What do we, what can we do for them? Uh, the three things that seem to limit bat distribution are food availability, uh, water availability, and roost availability. In a lot of places, roosts are the limiting factor because they can commute to the other two resources. So bat houses are a great way to attract bats if you want them in your neighborhood. Uh, the things to keep in mind is that not all bat houses are created equal. The smaller ones do not seem to be as attractive to bats. Larger bat houses offer a wider variety of temperatures inside the house and a more room for friends. How how big is a large bat house then? What are the measurements ish? Three chambers okay. or more seems to be better. You're looking at ones that are, you know, let's see. I'm trying to think. The small bat houses are tiny. So they're like the size of like a shoebox. And you mm. want something mm. about the size of a fish tank. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I can picture Not that. quite those same dimensions, but bigger. So multiple chambers, it seems to be better. Uh, generally, it seems that placing them up high seems to work better, somewhere between 8 and 15 feet. But I often see bats hanging out behind gutters on like the first story of a house. So height <laughs> isn't always the biggest thing. Oh, okay. So there are websites, uh, like Merlin Tuttle has a list, Bat Conservation International has a list of bat houses which they have looked at and approved those designs for oh that's great the bat house i have is from bat conservation and management which is from a bat consulting firm in pennsylvania and that one was super easy to hang up had instructions and everything the only difficult part was getting it up high on my house but (laughs) that can be the trickiest part is is doing a pole mount or mounting it on the side of the house pole mounts seem to do a little bit better often can you mount them on trees Trees are generally not recommended because of access to predators and there's Mm. a component of shade and that there's acoustic clutter, basically. So all the branches and Mm. things make it harder for them to find. Uh, There's some new, more innovative designs that mimic the exfoliating bark of trees, and those may be more attractive if they were placed there. But a lot of the bat house research is ongoing. And we found that some of the old recommendations for bat houses 
are bad, like painting it a black color in some areas mm. can lead to extremely high uh, temperatures on the inside that will kill the bats. So that's something that is still being investigated. So at this point, paint seems to reduce decay, which can be good, but painting it a black color is probably not the best. Maybe a blue or something like that may work a little bit better depending on your latitude and how much sunlight you're going to get. Well, that this reminds me of, speaking of hi- hibernation in houses, do all bats hibernate? No, no, some bats migrate. Uh, so that hoary bat we looked at a picture of earlier, they can enter torpor, but mostly they seem to migrate. And we don't know where they go exactly. So the routes mm. they take. That has been a big problem for wind energy. So bats are not good at avoiding wind turbines. So they get Aww. too close to those and they'll get struck or they will experience Barrow trauma. So basically their lungs will burst. They get the bends in midair. Oh, wow. Oh. That's terrible. Oh, oh gosh. man. Yeah. So Just aside from, my business, pow. aside from uh, white nose syndrome, wind energy is one of the major threats mm. or irresponsible wind energy. I should say a major threat to bats. Yeah, in they, they talk about bird strike a lot with wind energy, but mm. bats are just as effective yeah i worked on a wind mortality survey and we caught many more bats than birds Mm. so it may be that there's different structures like the size of the wind turbine affects which species are going to be struck Uh, the location certainly plays a role if they're on or off during the night like if you turn them off at low wind speed you'll hit less bats because Mm. higher winds less insects are going to be flying there's going to be less bats but at lower wind speeds, those blades are huge. You've seen them going down the freeway. So at the tip of those, they can still be going crazy fast, fast enough to, to for a bat to not avoid it. Wow. My gosh. Oh, those poor bats. <laughs> yeah, I just think about exploding in the oh. air. And it's like, ugh, dislike. Uh, so let's go over some of this. The, the power. I, I haven't been drawing along because Ooh. we were kind of having a very special episode. Oh, no, I have not been drawing along, I should say. Um <laughs> I thought you said you're like, sorry. I, I got really excited. I, 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 I thought Callie was hurting me. <laughs> so we talked about that the hearing was excellent, obviously. And that's true of, of all bats, even the ones that hunt fruits, which don't make a noise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They'd still be able to hear very well. So if we were to make a bat character, because we're Bugs Need Heroes, <laughs> I think you'd have to make it a villain character because it'd have to eat our our, our friends, the bugs. I'm imagining big, long, spindly hands because of their big, Ooh. their their wings. Um, we talked about that they're great singers. Really, I guess, I guess we should compare to Bruce Wayne, who already exists. <laughs> so if Bruce got bit by a radioactive bat, he would kill it on karaoke night because he just had all the dance and singing skills he wanted. He could hear excellently, fly, we talked about. He'd still be a member of the 1%, just because that's how it works. <laughs> Oh, he'd be a great father. I think we've seen that to be true <laughs> with all those little robins running around. Uh, we haven't talked about would a bat and a robin be friends? Well, I want to go back to that great father comment because oh, there actually okay. is a bat that was found where the males were lactating. Oh, a little uh, daddy juice, huh? <laughs> oh, daddy juice, Amanda. <laughs> oh, my no. God, daddy juice. <laughs> so, my, my. Dad. We don't know if they were if nursing or if there was an element of parental investment or just like because uh, male, other male other mammals report. can lactate sometimes. Hum, human yeah. males if you can got lactate. nipples, you can lactate. Yeah. yeah, so that was that was an investigation that needs to be followed up on was that finding, but it's something that I think is worth mentioning with all the comments about the bat suit having nipples. <laughs> oh, so maybe George wasn't doesn't need discounted quite so quickly. It's on the Val Kilmer bat suit too. Is it on the Val Kilmer suit? Yes, it is. Okay, I'll have to check. So you asked about robins. Uh, Yes, robins. Would a bat and a robin be friends? Like a la Stella Luna. No, No, they would not. There is uh, a bat species in Europe called the Greater Noctule, which hunts migrating songbirds in flight. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So they're both flying, and then the bat just takes them out? Yes, so these songbirds are migrating at night to avoid predatory raptors and oh. the bats are large enough that they have evolved or adapted to also take these birds opportunistically so these little birdies are like we can't fly during the day because there's there's red-tailed hawks out there they're gonna get us i don't know if it's red-tailed hawks but you know what i mean 
they're going to come and get us during the day. So I know, I know what we'll do. We'll fly at night when the birds are asleep. And then it didn't work. Cause now the bats got them. So now I'm going to upload a picture to the live to chat. Take a look at that. Oh, no. Oh, wow. wow. That bird's practically the same size as that bat, and he has taken it. It is his lunch now. Yeah, yeah so the name of this surprising. paper was actually, that, that like revealed this finding was called like Bats and Robins. Like, bat biologists can't resist a pun. <laughs> they also can't resist the Batman connection. Yeah, so Batman, his, his best sidekick would probably be poison ivy because of the complex relationship bats have as pollinators and seed dispersers. Mm. The flowers that attract the bats, they will have the ultraviolet light reflecting off the petals so that the bats can see it. They'll produce a strong odor that the bats can smell it. Then they'll bloom at night. And some of them create acoustic dead zones. So they'll have a bunch of fibers so that the bats can hear like, my echolocation isn't returning from this spot. There's something there. And they'll know, hey, this is where the flower's at. Or sometimes the leaves will be shaped in such a way to reflect the ultrasound back to the bat. So they'll, they'll trying to attract them visually with smells and with echolocation. They're adapted for the bats. And there's even a pitcher plant that co-evolved with this tiny little bat called Hardwick's woolly bat, which then roosts inside the pitcher. Oh, that's kind of cute. Hardwick's woolly yeah, I like bat. when they're asleep in the little leaves. There's a couple bats that do this sleep inside the leaves thing. It is just so cute. Oh, the Hardwick's Willy Bat is not cute. Well, <laughs> they can't all be winners. <laughs> he's got some little pointy teethies going on. Oh, so yeah, Merlin there, did there. A, a big photo shoot with this bat, and he trained it to come out and ask for mealworm treats. Or rather, mm-hmm. the bat learned to boop him in the nose to get an extra treat. Oh, that's funny. So bats are, are very smart little guys. Smart, they have to... Yeah. They're living in a fast-paced world, and they got to be able to to step up to that, or flap up to it, rather. <laughs> so one thing we always have to ask about is how long do they live? Being a mammal, they don't go through a pupil stage like our usual guests, <laughs> where they they spend 17 years as a baby and then two weeks as an adult. Uh, but how long does a bat live? Uh, the record is over 40, I think 42 years. Uh, it's a Dang. little tiny bat uh, relative to the little brown bat that we have here in North America. It's Brant's myotis. It was banded and then recaught some 40 plus years later. So it could be older than that, but we don't, we right, don't know. Because they don't know when they banded it. Yeah, they don't know the age at that point. Interesting. That's funny because a lot of small mammals just don't live very long. You think about your gerbils, and but they're also prey animals, so maybe... You know. Yeah, bats have extreme <laughs> longevity for their size, which can explain why, you know, Batman would still be fighting crime into his 40s or 50s or whatever in those. In 40s, yeah, he's been rocking on, 35 we're still, for a we're long, still long time. prime. <laughs> 40 year olds are. Uh, look at Tom Brady at 43. So Ugh, let's not look at Tom Brady in any situation. <laughs> guy uh, my, me real bad. my husband's from Boston, so we're a, uh, we're a Brady household. Or we were, he's not on the team anymore. I'm I'm more impressed with a uh, sixty year old Batman fighting crime. Yeah, it seems like Batman stories always dissolve into like he's sixty now and he still wants to fight crime, but he's too old and beaten but up his and back also hurts. incredibly bitter. He's ruined every relationship he's ever had, <laughs> and now he's got a clone son. <laughs> Spoiler oh, alert um, for Batman Beyond. <laughs> Derek, how long how long do bats? bat juveniles take to become adults what's the what's the baby stage uh so we mentioned that vampire bats take a little bit longer because they have to learn so much more most bats they will kind of or at least for north american bats they're independent by the end of the summer so they're born sometimes fast yeah pretty fast i think the shortest i've seen is like three or four weeks but i mean when you start out so large and you're you know only have to get you know another 30 percent larger or whatatever then Mm. it doesn't take quite as long give a birth to a 14 year old <laughs> yeah that's kind of how it is <laughs> gross <laughs> but yeah bats don't build nests with a few exceptions there are bats which roost inside tents which they make by biting trees or not trees but you know large leaves and then mm. it collapses this like banana leaf so it folds over into a tent that they roost inside and then the the thought is that it's primarily male bats that make these and then use mm. them to attract the lady bats 
but uh, <laughs> I forget what I, what was the question. Uh, how long do they? <laughs> stay how long babies? do they live? Yeah, yeah, how long do they stay babies? Yeah, when they're born, their their hands are cartilage, just like just like us human babies. The bones aren't fully ossified. So you're able to look at captured bats in late summer and see if they're still juveniles because they'll still have that kind of cartilage growth plate at the end of their joints. Oh, interesting. That's cool. Yeah. Older than that, it gets, you start looking at things like teeth wear and, you know, doing molecular tests on the, you know, strontium in their fur, stuff like that, which is beyond me. <laughs> so if a bat needs to become a member of the 1%, what kind of company would he open? <laughs> <laughs> Probably like a uh, tequila company, like like Clooney, because uh, bats are the sole pollinators of the agave plant. The, so we've talked before about how chocolate comes from like one bug. So the tequila is coming from one species of bat or a couple species of bat? There's a couple, uh, the Mexican long-nosed bat, and I think it's the Mexican long-tongued bat. I'll have to splice in if I got that wrong. But they're migratory yeah. species that come up from Mexico and follow the blooming of the agave and visit those and agave only blooms like once every hundred years or something and then it dies immediately after that oh really i didn't realize that about uh, i don't drink tequila so <laughs> the life cycle of, of tequila is beyond me but the, the harvesting of tequila happens before they bloom so if you're too intensive with your tequila farming you're not leaving enough agave for the plants to visit and you don't want all of your plants to be clones of each other because that leaves them susceptible to disease like yeah. what has happened with bananas right bananas another one pollinated by bats but all domesticated bananas don't produce seeds so they're all clones really wow we've really fudged up bananas yeah <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know we'd fud- i knew we had fudged up bananas but i didn't realize how badly we'd fudged up bananas oh so so derek bats are obviously pretty pretty reliant on their wings what happens if they tear that? Because the membrane's pretty fine, right? If you feel a bat, you almost don't feel the wings because it's so stretchy and soft and small and that like... It's like skin, right? It's skin, yes. It's yeah. highly vascularized. It's got lots of muscles, tiny microscopic muscles in there. So it feels kind of like the skin of your eyelids almost, but... Oh. Yeah, very, very thin skin. And since it's so vascularized, it can re- recover from tears pretty easily. So it's not uncommon for bats to, you know have that wing membrane damaged during flight or fighting or, you know, whatever. If you go to the zoo, you'll often see your fruit bats, you know, getting into squabbles about things. How long does it take for a tear to heal on average? Uh, I think a a hole the size of like a quarter or so would take less than a year or so. I don't know the the Mm. precise numbers, Mm. but bats in rehabilitation do pretty well if they're able to be triaged. Uh, When that happens, they don't let them go into hibernation, from what I understand. So they can continue to heal throughout that winter and they just get, you know, lots it's more constantly interesting. in their enclosure shaking them awake. Hey, 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 no sleeping. Hey. I think it would be more that you just keep the room too hot for them to go to sleep. Oh, I see. Not as funny. Um, that's me all summer. All summer long. It's too hot. Bats are very smart. They have been trained to respond to rock and roll music. In what way? So there is a bat in Central and South America called Trachops, the fringe-lipped bat, and it uh, hunts frogs. So it listens for frogs to make their little sounds uh, when they're calling for a mate. And then Mm -hmm. this bat then eavesdrops and then ambushes the frogs as they're attracting a mate. And you can train them to respond to other sounds. Like if you play a different noise and then give them a treat. So they will then associate this (laughs) other sound with food food similar to like you know clicker training a dog or whatever so that there have been bats that have trained to respond to this novel stimuli as similar to the frog call and then released back after the research was concluded and they found that bats remembered this novel sound cue four years later and i think in this case it was rock and roll music because that was the most thematically appropriate novel Um, stimulus they could think of that's very cool that's very very cool yeah, if you want to know more about that research, uh, the website is, I think it's noseleaf.org. It's Dr. Rachel Page's lab that does a lot of that work with trachops. Hmm. So I've, speaking of clicker training, I've heard that humans inspired by bats can learn to echolocate. Yes, that's true. There's a, a This American Life about a guy who does that, a blind man named Daniel Kish, and he can ride a bicycle. 
Wow, that's amazing. Based only on echolocating as a human. Yeah, he like clicks his tongue, I believe is how he does it. That's crazy. People are amazing. <laughs> Biology is pretty incredible. <laughs> really, really incredible. What, what we're capable of. What animals in general are capable of, not just people. So, uh, listener question from uh, one of my friends when I asked. <laughs> listener <laughs> question, what's the cutest bat? Because we've seen a lot of cute... Seen a lot of cute bats today. What is the mm-hmm. cutest bat? Sorry, I'm waiting to make sure that Desi isn't going to scream. Oh, during sorry. That. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'd say the cutest is probably the Honduran white bat. They are an almost entirely white species. I'll pull up a picture here. Oh, they're very cute. Look at how yellow their little ears are. Yeah, you don't see a lot of yellow mammals. No, yeah, that's a carotenoid that they sequester from their food. They exclusively eat figs, and they're one of those species that lives in tents. So the all-white oh, color makes it so that they are basically translucent under the green leaf as the light shines through. Oh, they're so cute. That's probably the cutest species. I would say uh, after that it might be the spotted bat or the hoary bat would be my next contenders, if you're not including the flying foxes, which all kind of look like flying dogs. <laughs> it's almost cheating to say they're the cutest. The flying yeah, foxes. And it- of the of the flying foxes, I'd say the Livingstone's fruit bat is probably the cutest. It has little round ears, so it looks just like a teddy bear. Aww. Uh, another really cute bat, I think, is the pallid bat, which is found in uh, the western United States in more arid regions. They hunt insects on the ground, so they have the big ears because they're listening for prey rather than catching it out of the air. Mm. And they, one of their big prey sources is scorpions, which is extremely cool. And uh, they have little pig noses, I think. So they're they're pretty cute as well. They, uh, along with some other desert bats, are immune to scorpion venom. Oh, that's very cool. I think it's in BBC's Life 2, or maybe Planet Earth 2. One of those. There is an extended sequence of a desert long-eared bat hunting a scorpion. And they I think I remember watching that. Yeah. It's pretty intense. Is, is that Desi in the background? Yeah, that's Desi. She Aww. wants something, so... Uh, I think I need to go tend to that. <laughs> anyway, uh, so out of uh, out of five bottles of tequila, how many <laughs> how many bottles do you give the Batman in comparison to our bat friends? Are you, you starting with me? Part. I don't. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't think he matches very well. Um, to be honest, in most regards, um, so I guess like two out of five two out of five okay so he's social and a great dancer but other than that (laughs) nothing yeah because he doesn't have the powers of the bat he should have more things i mean the the closest you get is really in like the arkham games where you can press you know x or whatever and get detective vision and you can see everyone around corners and things like that that's kind of the closest you you come to to being Mm. a bat in those games what would yeah, you give him, Amanda? Glad. Uh, for Batman, I would give him, yeah, two. He's not very batty. I mean, he's a great hero, don't get me wrong, but like, he's just not very batty. For bats themselves, five bottles of tequila. We're getting we're getting turned on these tequilas because <laughs> bats are really cool. And we I feel like we just barely scratched the surface of all the different bats because there's so many kinds of bats and each one is so cool. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, I think I'd give Batman a, a one. Yeah. <laughs> a one Not bottle very of tequila. Uh, even uh, his ears aren't very batty. You yeah. Know? He just kind of has little pointy ones, more devilly. It's like that uh, that tweet that's like, if you told me that there was a hero that's blind and uses echolocation... <laughs> and he's not called the batman <laughs> I, i'd punch you in the face you know whatever it is uh my my son I, I think he's a little bit confused he's got the right spirit but he's a little confused that he seems to think that for halloween you must dress as a halloween thing last year he was a spider <laughs> this year he's been saying bat we'll see if That's that cute. comes to fruition um but i think he thinks you have to be a halloween thing for halloween that so is we'll a, see. Uh, that's a thought, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you're when you're a little baby child, <laughs> barely out of his uh, learning how to drink blood phase here, still learning. 
<laughs> yeah, you did not give birth to a 14-year-old. So you I did wait. not give birth to a 14-year-old, <laughs> so he has to still learn how to be a, a, a human, unfortunately. <laughs> Which, um, like a bat, does involve a lot of screaming. Yeah. Oh, I'm he's sure. just trying to find his way around. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was um, this was awesome, Derek. Thank you for talk chatting with us about bats. Uh, I'm sorry you have to edit yourself now. That's gonna <laughs> yeah. Be I'm I'm not looking forward to that <laughs> at all. <laughs> So happy Halloween to those of you who are celebrating Halloween. I hope you have a nice dry Halloween. Get all that candy. Remember that if you're drinking any tequila, if you care about tequila, you care about bats. We'll see you next time, guys. Bye. Bugs Need Heroes is created by Derek Conrad and Kelly Zimmerman. Hosted by Amanda Allen Nide and Kelly Zimmerman. Bugs Need Heroes is produced and edited by Derek Conrad. Our music is Ladybug Castle by Roll Music. All character art by Amanda Allen Nide. Got a bug question? Email us at bugsneedheroes at gmail.com. Check us out on bugsneedheroes.com for the visual companion to our episodes with the artwork of the bug related heroes. We also have an Instagram, Twitter, and subreddit under the Bugs Need Heroes name. Thanks for coming by.